About two years ago, there were some record-breaking snow for the South. And if you know anything about the South, you know that it basically shuts down, even at like two inches. Right? The to town's totally shut down. And in our little town we were living in at the time in Arkansas, that was the case because the city was totally unprepared. And the reason is, even though in comparison to how I grew up in Ohio, where every hour my dad and I would be going out and shoveling snow because it was just, it would, it would keep coming. And so in comparison to what I grew up with, this was actually a really small amount of snow. But the little town that I grew up, or that little town that we were in in Arkansas just didn't have the equipment and was not prepared. And people, by and large, were unprepared for this snow that we had. People didn't have uh, the, they didn't store up the food. Uh, a lot of people didn't have the warm clothes that we might have up here. And a lot of people didn't have any salt or any snow shovels. And so many people were unprepared. And I was part of the many people. Because when me and my wife bought our first house in Arkansas, the last thing I thought that we needed to buy was a snow shovel in Arkansas. Because I was promised warm weather. And that's not what we got. And by the way, Arkansas got some snow this weekend too. <laughs> uh, they get snow as well. And so I kind of panic, okay, what are we going to do? How are we going to clear our driveway? Uh, and so I, I jump on what anyone does when you have this problem. You jump on Amazon and you plan to get that, your package there as soon as possible. But that was, this was a problem even two-day shipping couldn't solve. I know, hard to imagine. And, and so we were there, we didn't have any shovel, didn't have any equipment, and so I was actually out there with a large green rake shoveling the snow. And it actually worked a lot better than you would imagine it would. And then sure enough, uh, we're there for several days a week, uh, roads totally covered, everything was shut down, shut down, and my snow shovel came in. However, it was the day it was like 70 out and the snow had already melted, and so it wasn't much use to me. So I had this snow shovel and no, sh and no snow. So I had two options. I could take the snow shovel back, or I could move to Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> and I really hate standing in the line at UPS, so here we are. <laughs> Which is the story of how we came to Ohio. No, it's not how we came to Ohio. But the importance of preparation. We all know the importance of preparation. This is the important preparation applies to every aspect of our life. It applies to our jobs. It applies to our marriages, to raising kids, importance of um, preparation. It even boils down to our food, no pun intended, right? But you have to prepare, that you have to, to plan out. It applies certainly to public speaking. It applies to every single area of our life. And the importance of preparation is, also comes to the surface when we think about becoming a disciple of Jesus, becoming a Christian. And I want to think about that for a moment because I think this is an area we often, or it's easy to neglect. I grew up with a mindset, and, um, or at least I've seen it in various places that I have been, is this mindset that the, the ultimate goal of discipleship is just to get somebody baptized. Just get them in the water. There's been many church foyers where I've been standing in and and someone will come up to me and they'll, they'll point at a teen or point at a young person or point at someone who has just started coming to church and be like, they'll put their arm around me and say, well, young men, what do we need to do to get them baptized? As if that was just the total goal. And then after that, you know, who cares what happens to them because they're baptized, right? They're saved. And there's just mindset that that's the ultimate goal for discipleship. I heard Kyle, Kyle Eidelman tell a story one time where he told a story of a man from another country who came to America back in the 80s, and this man was just totally amazed by the superstores that we had. These superstores like Walmart that just had all these amazing, convenient products. And he was amazed by these products that you just add water to, right? He, he saw uh, this this thing called egg powder, and he was fascinated by that, and he, he wrote home and, and told them, I just can't believe they have this egg power where you just add water, and it makes eggs. And then he began to subscribe uh, this milk powder where you just add water, and it makes milk. And then he saw on the, 
uh, the aisle at the supermarket, he saw this pancake powder where you just add water, it makes pancakes, cornbread, all these things where you just add water. And then he wrote to his family back home and he says, and the most amazing thing, unbelievable thing is they actually sell baby powder. Okay, took a second. All right. We know it's not true in life that you just add water and it brings about the transformation that we seek, right? And that's true of discipleship. You can't just add water and expect someone to be a disciple. It's not a win just to get them in the baptistry. There's a lot more that goes into what it means to be a disciple. The person on the screen here, his name is Walter Scott. And if you're familiar with Churches of Christ, this goes back to what we call the American Restoration Movement or the Stone Campbell Movement. And Walter Scott was a preacher among that movement, and particularly he had a lot of influence in the 1830s. And during this time, he came up with what we call the five-finger exercise. And you might know it better as maybe the plan of salvation or the five steps for salvation. And it actually started like this, and I'm going to put up the list, and it might look a little bit differently than what we know today as the five steps for salvation. You had faith, repentance, baptism, remission of sins, gift of the Holy Spirit, eternal life. Now, that looks different than the one you know, but this is how it originally started. And so what Walter Scott would would do is when he would come into an area uh, for a revival or gospel meeting, he'd come to preach, he would first go to the elementary schools or to a playground, and he'd meet some of the kids in the town Uh, And he would recite these six things on his hand. And so he would teach it to them on on, on their hands. He would say, put up one finger. He said, faith, repentance, baptism, remission of sins. And then he kind of threw the last two together since they go hand in hand. Gift of the Holy Spirit and eternal life. Now what he would do is he, he would teach the kids to be able to recite this on their hands. They would remember it because it's on their hands. And then they would go home to their parents and then they would recite these things. And the parents, out of curiosity, oftentimes would come to the revival or to the gospel meeting. Now, actually, over a short period of time, early on in the 1800s as well, a certain part of the movement, the Restoration Movement, adapted Walter Scott's five-finger exercise and made it more like this, which is hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. And that's probably the five steps that you are more familiar with. But isn't it interesting how it went from here to here. As you think about this list right here, the first three focus on what God does. These are things, um, what, or sorry, the, the first three are things that we do, and the second three are things that God does, right? We respond in faith, repentance, and baptism. God responds by forgiving us, by giving us uh, his presence, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and eternal life. Whereas this list will focus more on what we do, and that's not a bad thing by the way. But what it has done, I think in some circles, I know I experience this some, is that when we put any list together, whether it's the first list or that second list and what the five steps became, when we put a list together, we run the risk of people thinking that that's all there is to do, right? But you know that that's not true, right? That this five steps aren't all that's required to be a disciple. And here's why I know why. Because as I put these five and we say, here, repent, confess, be baptized, there's probably something in your mind, like a refrain of a song that's saying, and be faithful unto death. Right? You remember, we always add that sixth step there. And so the point is that these lists, although they're helpful, they're good, especially for teaching children about what discipleship is and what it means to come to Jesus, when we put these short lists together, we always run the risk of misrepresenting the gospel. And here's all I mean by that, is that this isn't everything. That this actually isn't sufficient knowledge even to create a disciple, because there's so many things that we're leaving out. I remember when this first came to my attention, was at my home congregation in Springfield, we had this posted on this big sign at the, uh, on some of the front doors. And they actually added a step, and I thought this was crazy. It said, hear, believe, love God, repent, confess, be baptized. And I thought that was weird, and I remember thinking, we added a step. <laughs> what have we done? <laughs> and then it was explained to me, no, like, that's like, the first and greatest command, right? That's important. It's good to have there. But the point is that this is just simply a teaching tool, right? You don't have this list at some scripture and say, this is, this is the formula, right? But instead, we have these things pieced together throughout scripture that we believe are important, but 
it leaves out several other things that are important to being a disciple. And what we've often done is we've made it all about just completing these steps, memorizing these steps, being able to, to say these things, and then we let people go and say, go live the Christian life. But there's a lot more. Right? The model of just getting them into the water, ASAP, is simply an inadequate preparation for the Christian life, for making disciples. And what are disciples? We said this last week in our first lesson in the series, is that the disciples are lifetime learners, followers, and imitators of Jesus. And when we look at what Jesus says about this preparation and becoming a disciple, we're going to see this morning that Jesus doesn't necessarily ask disciples to take a step as much as he instructs them to take a moment and sit and take a seat. So let's look at our text this morning in Luke chapter 14 with these things in mind. And look at Jesus' teaching on discipleship. Picking up in Luke 14 and verse 25 and 27. We pick up in verse 25. It says, Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said. But I want you to notice that first sentence seems kind of odd as we think about the ministry of Jesus. Because when we think about the ministry of Jesus, or at least I do, is what I think about is I think about Jesus being on the cross without any disciples. All have forsaken him. And so sometimes we forget that actually Jesus was a very popular person. A lot of people wanted to hear the message that he had. They saw the miracles he was doing. They saw feeding of the 5,000, all these things, and it was gathering crowds together. But, as we think about all these large crowds coming to Jesus, we often realize, in modern terms, Jesus would not have been a very successful social media influencer. Meaning, although he had all the views, he didn't always gain all the followers. People weren't just waiting at the door to smash that subscribe button. Because, what Jesus would often do is, as he gathered these large crowds together, he would often teach very difficult things. And you have to think from the disciples' perspective, they've, as we've looked in the series on the chosen and, and all that these disciples gave up to become his disciples and followers, you had to think sometimes they were thinking, Jesus, what are you doing? We've given our lives to this. Why do you teach such di difficult things? But case in point is verse 26. It says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such person cannot be my disciple. And so here's an instance where Jesus has this great crowd, this great following, but then he teaches something difficult, and you can just imagine the people, oh, okay, I'm out of here. And they walk away. But as we look at this passage, it's difficult for us to understand, is that Jesus says that you must actually hate those who you're closer with. Now, our lesson is not to necessarily explore this. I just want to point out Jesus says something difficult. As one writer, Leon Morris, says, Jesus' meaning is surely that the love the disciple has for Jesus, for him, must be so great that the best of earthly loves is hatred by comparison. It's, it's about priority. It's about placing your, your priority towards Jesus above all other relationships. Not that you're to hate in the way in which we use the word, because a disciple of Jesus really isn't supposed to hate anybody. Love God, love your neighbor, first and second commandment. That definitely includes your family. But at the same time, Jesus says, but in comparison, right, or, or, or Jesus says here that you are to prioritize your love towards me in order to be my disciple. You can't love any of these people more than me. And so ultimately, what Jesus is saying here is, I believe it's about priority. It's about prioritizing and planning by giving God your all above all things. Okay? And he says, And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. And so we're to give all to him. We're to prioritize all to him. To put all things above him. An example of this might be the way in which we give. As we think about that today on our Mission Sunday. As we want to be giving people. We want to be people that give God all um, that we can and that includes our financial resources, how do you become a generous giver? Well, it takes prioritizing, right? If giving to the Lord or to those who are in need around you, if that's a priority for you in your life, it needs to be in your budget. It needs, you need to set those things aside or else right, you'll never do it. Because, here's why, is because prioritizing takes 
planning. As we draw that back to thinking about what it means to be a follower of Jesus, which certainly includes our giving, but the same is true for our time in which we give the Lord in prayer. Those things take prioritizing. Giving God our all takes prioritizing, it takes planning, it takes preparation, it takes setting aside that time. That your time spent advancing the gospel, we need to think about those things intentionally. Right? Because following Jesus takes a certain priority. Next, what Jesus does in this passage in Luke 14 is that he gives three illustrations in order to expose what he's saying here, to, to illustrate what he says here, so what it means to take up their cross, follow him in order to be his disciple, and doing that exclusively in a prioritized way. The first illustration here is in verses 28 and through 30 as he talks about this unprepared builder. He says, suppose that one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay a foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you. In verse 29. Um, and then he says this in verse 30, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. All right, we all know what this looks like. As I think about snow, I think about those people who will start to, to clear the driveway, but then they leave the end right there where the snowmobile like comes and like piles it on, and then it's like impossible to actually get in the driveway because it's so piled up. Right, started something, then you get to that like really hard, icy stuff, and you don't want to finish it, or the slush that collects at the end of your driveway. You begin a job, and then it gets really hard, and you want to call it quits. Um, I think I can remember several times, my dad's here today, as me and him were out there shoveling snow that I wanted to call it quits. He said, no, we're finishing it, because that's what we do. We said we're going to do it, we're going to finish it. I think back to, um, you know, we all, we all think of, when we read what Jesus says here, we can imagine either government projects or maybe personal residential projects that were started with good intentions to do these big, great things in construction, but when you get to the end of the project, you realize you've run out of money and you can't finish. Uh, there was, I have a family member who bought a house recently, and this house is beautiful. But as you go on the inside, there's some fascinating things. Because inside of the house, there's several little kind of customized features in this house that were built by the, build, uh, by the people who were originally building the house. One, they were building their dream house, and it's actually a little bit sad. Like, they go through, and there's like these custom things that relate back to their family, like these doors that were, intent, that were part of their childhood home that they were putting into this house. But when they got to the end of the project, they weren't able to finish. And so now my family, they bought this house and you have all these customary things that are explained because this other family was building the house, but they're unable to finish. And so we all can probably think of situations like that in life, in which we start something but we didn't sit down and accurately count the cost, and then we're unable to finish. Jesus says, that's not what you're to do as you think about becoming my disciple. I don't want you to just smash that like button, smash that subscribe button, become a subscriber of me. I want you to actually think about what it means to meet my disciple, and then make your choice accordingly. So Jesus emphasizes here the importance of taking a seat, sitting down, calculating what it really means to follow him and sitting down to count the cost. The second illustration is about this unprepared king here in verse 31 and verse 33, and this one's just slightly different. It says, or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider or count whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? And if he is not able... He will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for the terms of peace. And we've all lived through situations in, in, which involve our country deciding to go to war. And every time a decision like that is made, right, there's people on both sides. There's people who are saying, yes, this is a justified war. Our country should spend the resources to do it. We can win it. We should do it. It's just. It's righteous. We should, we should be involved in this. And then there's other people on the other side, who say, no, this is a waste of our resources. This is not a good thing for us to, to spend money on to go to war. And so what Jesus describes here is actually pretty applicable, right? We've lived through these type of situations. But again, Jesus' emphasis is take a seat. You need to count out whether or not you're going to be able to do it. 
However, in this situation, there's kind of this extra element of surrender, right? If you count the cost and realize, right, you can't, and you need to surrender. Is he prepared to surrender? And as we think about these two parables, as one writer points out, the first parable, the first story, illustration, is Jesus is saying, sit down and decide whether you can afford to follow me. Like, are you going to follow through if you can actually, if you decide to follow me? Can you afford it? Are, are you going to be able to prioritize it enough to be my follower when things get hard, when things get challenging, when you're running low on steam? Are you going to be able to continue to be my disciple? But the second one is a little bit different. Jesus basically says, sit down and reckon whether you can afford to refuse my demands. As we think about that for just a moment. The second parable is saying, in other words, if you refuse to follow Jesus, you are ultimately setting yourself up against God. And is that something you can afford to do? So Jesus challenges you to take a seat and to consider this at both angles. If you decide to follow him, can you afford to do so? If you decide not to follow him, can you afford to do so? So the point is, becoming a follower of Jesus takes some consideration, takes some meditation, takes some time to sit down and to think about it. And then he says in verse 33, and I think he's really wrapping all this up into kind of like one point. He says, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything, you cannot be my disciples. And again, that goes back to Jesus' original difficult teaching that we looked at at the beginning of this lesson. Is Jesus calling us to love him above all other things? Is that's what he's saying. He's summing this up. Is those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. And that takes a calculation. That takes a, a sitting down and thinking about it. That doesn't just take a giving, you just give it up and throw it away. Because all we know, any of us who have started diets and we've renounced a certain food, right, that temptation comes back up over and over again. Unless you have resolved it in your mind to commit to that, you know you're going to struggle. And so you don't just give something up, but you renounce and that's the idea, to give up, is this idea of to renounce. It means, in the original languages, to kiss it goodbye. To give up interest in, to, to throw it to the side. But it's not just a casual kind of, okay, I'm done with it. It's like a committed, no, I'm committed to giving this up in the name of Jesus. It means that you decide to follow Jesus and you declare, I no longer am going to fo follow the pursuit of blank. I'm no longer going to give my life to the searching for success. I'm no longer going to give my life to making a name for myself. I'm no longer going to give my life for whatever it might be that you're currently pursuing. And so following Jesus means that you totally change the driving force of your life and the way in which you are going and the way in which you're moving towards before you become a follower of Jesus. And then Jesus has this third illustration as we wrap up our thoughts here is this illustration, and it kind of seems odd, but it's this illustration of salt in verse 34 and 35. And it kind of seems like it's tagged on there, added on at the end, but I think it's connected. It's a, Jesus says, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? In verse 35, it is neither fit, neither for the soil, nor for the manure pile, and it is thrown out. For whoever has ears, let them hear. Now, again, it kind of seems like it's just added on there at the end, like this additional kind of proverb added randomly by Jesus to his teaching. But that's not the case. I don't, I don't believe it is. I think the point is that if you decide to become a disciple of Jesus without first counting the cost, you're going to end up like salt that has lose, lost its taste. Now, who in here likes to have salt on their food? We all like salt on our food. We might use a lot of salt. You probably have to limit it because your doctor said, hey, this, you, know, you need to limit your sodium intake. But you still need sodium, right? It's still good uh, for you to an extent at a balanced, in a balanced way. But let me ask you this. For all of those of you who are excessive salt pourers, I've seen some people where I sit down with them and they pour salt all over their green beans. And it's like, do you want some green beans with your salt? Like, there's just so much salt. Because in the America, we love our salt. Right? You get those french fries, and they're covered in salt. You're going to have salt all over your hands. We just use so much salt. But let me ask you this. Would you use salt if it didn't have any taste? <laughs> would you pile it all on there if it had no taste? Well, what would be the point? 
right? Your sodium levels are going to be through the roof, and it doesn't even taste good. Okay, what would be the point? And what I believe Jesus is saying here is that what good are we for the world as disciples of Jesus if we have not totally committed ourselves over to him to be his disciple, to practice, to actually live out the radical and graceful life that we claim to live, the way of Jesus. Yet these are the types of people we become, these types of disciples that we become. If we make the commitment to be a follower of Jesus, yet we do not take time to sit down and count the cost. We end up become club members instead of cross bearers, right? We end up becoming cultural Christians, which are people who are Christians because it's popular in our culture, which by the way, by and large, it still is pretty popular in America to be a Christian based on the numbers. And so are we just cultural Christians or are we committed disciples? Because when we do the opposite, when we are disciples of Jesus without the commitment, without the renouncing of all other things, we end up becoming people who are filled with apathy, People who are, live in perpetual inaction. People who have no ambition for the advance of the kingdom of God on earth. And that's not what Jesus has called us to be. That's not what Jesus has called us to. Therefore, we need to sit down and count the cost. As we consider becoming a disciple of Jesus. We've got to ask the question, and even if you are a disciple, you need to ask yourself this question this morning. Am I ready to renounce all to be a lifetime learner, follower, and imitator of Jesus? Am I ready to be a true disciple? We need to sit down and count the cost. And what Jesus says here is that we need to count the cost as you take up the cross. We all think about taking up the cross. We all think about this, this imagery of what it means to bear your own cross. and to, to It's kind of this great idea, this ambitious idea of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. But we often forget to count the cost. It's a beautiful thing when we take up the cross. It's a beautiful thing when we live that out. But it doesn't become beautiful. We don't become the salt and light of the earth unless we count the cost. So what's this look like in various areas of our life? Today on Mission Sunday, as we're focusing on our mission works, and we define missions as going in all the world and challenging others to take up the cross. And we want you to give to these efforts. We prioritize them. That's why we have a day like this. We're prioritizing advancing the kingdom of God through the various mission efforts that we are involved in and investing in here and Northeast. But we also want you to be personally challenged because the mission always starts with me. The mission starts with you. Have you renounced all to become a follower of Jesus? Have you renounced all to be his disciple? And this applies to at least three different areas I want to think about for just a moment. It applies to those who need to hear the gospel, right? Obviously, Right, those who are not yet disciples of Jesus. And you and I actually take part in that as we seek to advance the kingdom. And we do so by teaching others. We, we sit down with them and we count the cost with them. We help them count the cost. We don't hide the negatives of being a Christian. We don't hide the challenges just to get them baptized, right? just to put them in the water. Right? But we actually sit down and be real and show them, here's, here's, yes, here are the challenges. But we also show them, the incredible blessings of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. We show them why we have become disciples of Jesus to begin with, despite the challenges. But we do show them the challenges, right? Because becoming a disciple of Jesus is so much more than memorizing and repeating five steps. It means learning what it takes day in and day out to daily, as Jesus says in Luke 9, verse 23, take up your cross and follow him. It means helping people prioritize. It means helping them seek the kingdom first and what that looks like. Helping them prioritize their love, their resources, and their time. Sitting down and helping people do that. It's not going to be quick. It may not even be done, right? It may, it may not be done as fast as we might want it to be. But we're helping people count the costs as they take up the cross. Helping p people realize that they need to be willing to give up any earthly possession or allegiance for the sake of the gospel. Second, we need to do this with our children. We need to take the time to count the cost with our children. We need to guide them and to instruct them by sitting down with them and helping them understand the cost of being 
a disciple. And I actually got to do that with the Reinhardts this week as Colton was baptized. And we got to celebrate with that. It was after services last Sunday. And what a joy that was. But that's what his parents did. They took time, studied with him, and they sat with him, especially last Saturday afternoon and evening. They helped him count the cost. They said, are you ready for this? They supported him in that. And that's all we can ever hope for for parents here in Northeast is that we're intentional with that. Take time and to count the cost with our children. And so with that being said, we also cannot expect our children to have a perfect understanding of the faith. Why? Because none of us have that. Right? None of us are perfect in our understanding. None of us have all the answers. And so that's not the point. But this idea of counting the cost with their children, this strikes at the heart of what historically has been called believer's baptism, which goes back a long way, I mean, obviously to the New Testament, but especially throughout Christian history. And that is, baptism is for those who are able to make the valid decision for themselves, those who can consciously count the cost. And to think about what they're doing. Because again, we're not in the business of forcing people or manipulating people or tricking people into becoming Christians. We instead want to help them count the cost. But I would add to this also that parents also need to count the cost if they are going to train their children to be disciples. Why? Because as a parent, there's a lot of cost for you to be a parent of a disciple. It means surrendering them unto the Lord, to whatever plans he might have to them. Jonathan Storman, a preacher in Little Rock, Arkansas, he talks about his time as a young adult minister in Texas. And as he would work with just hundreds of young, uh, young adults, he said that there would often be two types of parents. First, there was the parents who would come to him and wanted him to talk their children into becoming disciples, right? He wanted to talk, he wanted, the parents wanted Jonathan to talk the children into, in, into greater faith, which they believed their children to be apathetic, they believed that they weren't where they needed to be, they weren't committed to the Lord, and they were concerned, and rightly so. So they, they wanted him to talk them into faith. But then the second type of parent was those who came to him, and they wanted him to actually talk them out of faith. What do we mean by that? Because what kind of parent would do that? And I'm talking about committed Christian parents. Now, they wouldn't have said it quite like that. But when they got news that their children were going off into these dangerous missions, going to these places they didn't want their children to go to, putting themselves in situations for the sake of the kingdom that they didn't want them to be in, they would come to him and say, please, talk them out of this. Show them how this isn't safe. This isn't a good move financially or this isn't the direction uh, that they should be going into. As we think about Mission Sunday, we want to, even us, we need to count that cost. Are we ready to turn our children over to the Lord and allow Him to make the plans for them in the way in which they might be part of advancing the kingdom? We've got to let them renounce all in order to become a disciple. And then lastly, as this applies to those of us who already are Christians, and we certainly had some of those applications already. But I want the first aspect of what we've talked about today obviously applies to those who are considering becoming a Christian. But I believe it also has some real applications for you and I who have already taken up the cross. And that's this, is that there's this aspect of, of what Jesus talks about here that happens on a daily basis. Remember Luke 9.23, we've already quoted, take up your cross daily and follow me. Therefore, there's this kind of aspect in which we daily count the cost and say, today, am I going to renounce all so that I can be a disciple of Jesus? Am I going to set my agenda aside today so that I can be about his kingdom purposes? Am I going to give myself over to him fully today by emptying myself out and allowing him to fill me? And daily, regularly sitting down to consider and renew the commitment that we have made to the Lord. And if we do this, I believe, as Jesus says, we will be the salt of the earth. We will be the light of the world. It takes a day-by-day -day commitment and decision to do so. Probably like you, I've heard a lot of great stories of faith, of people who've given it all uh, for Jesus and have actually given their lives in a literal way, and have lived in, in terrible circumstances. As we think about what would it be like to be a Christian in China, in North Korea, in Afghanistan, Right now, what would it be like? I see pictures on Facebook all the time by preachers involved in the Ukraine. What would it be like to be a Christian right now in the Ukraine? 
What would it be like right now to be a true disciple of Jesus in Russia right now? And we think about all the amazing stories they probably have of the challenges that they faced and, and renouncing all to follow Jesus in their very difficult context. And we think, how are they able to do it? And here's what I would suggest to you, that these are Christian. No, these are disciples, followers of Jesus, who have taken time to count the cost and decided that this is worth it despite the challenges. And when you look at the crucifixion, what do you see? You see an innocent man suffering. Why? Because the Romans overpowered him? No. But because Jesus counted the cost and decided you were worth it. Decided I was worth it. Decided this world was worth it. And so he did it because he counted the cost. And so is he worth it to you? Will you count the cost and take up the cross and become a daily real life follower? Jesus. If you have that desire to become a disciple, then this church is full of spiritual leaders, people, myself included, elders, staff, and so many other wonderful people who would love to sit down and to count the cost and, and explore, study with you. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? What does it mean to, to really not just be a cultural Christian, right? not just to join a club today, but what does it mean to be a follower? We'd love to sit down with you more, and that's what we're going to continue to explore in this series. Thank you for being here today, and you can join us as we, as we sing.